Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Lancashire Business View's annual Doing the Deal event. Circumstances, of course, prevent us from meeting in person over coffee and stimulating conversation, but frankly, I'm loaded with caffeine. And we have a fantastic selection of guests today who will, I am sure, provide ample stimulus. My name is Richard Slater, and I'm the publisher of Lancashire Business View magazine. I'm delighted to welcome all of you to this event presented in association with Access to Finance, Assets and CG Professional. It's been quite a year and without dwelling too much on that, like many areas of business, the M&A market was a little quieter than might have otherwise been expected. That said, our editor Jed Henderson and his team have reported throughout the year on the deals being done, medical practices, furnishings businesses, care homes, energy businesses, vaping outfits, We've had some big deals and today we have guests who were involved in the biggest in-county deal of 2020, the purchase of Clive Hurt by Fox Brothers. And you can't have missed the continuing surge of Blackburn-based Euro garages with its acquisitions in Europe, Australia and the USA. They also gave new meaning to the phrase, I'm just nipping to the shops, love, by coming home with all of Asda. So today, We've gathered deal-making experts from the four corners of this fine county and beyond. We'll be hearing from those who have done the deal and those who have advised them. And our job today is a simple one, to share experiences to help our viewers and readers take the best decisions that they can. So, let's get to the business end of the day and introduce the agenda. In a moment, I'll be welcoming directors from Fox Brothers, their purchase of Clifford, as I mentioned, a big deal in the county last year. Then, in our first panel, we will meet the entrepreneurs and the intrapreneurs who have successfully bought and sold businesses. And in our second, we will hear from the, we will hear from the advisors who help realise the ambitions and perhaps manage the expectations of their clients. They are the professionals who smooth the waters towards a successful transaction. The conversations today will form the basis of an extended Doing the Deal feature in Lancashire Business View's March, April, print edition and also online and our readers and our viewers all 50,000 of them and especially our editor are hanging on their every word please feel free to join the conversation today by asking questions or making observations in the chat box and at the end of or rather at the formal conclusion of the event we will decamp to the informal chaos of an all-in networking event should you wish to stay and join us for a virtual brew at the end. Ladies and gentlemen, let's begin by welcoming our sponsors. From Access to Finance, my apologies, I'll try that again. From Access to Finance, Senior Specialist Mark Gibbons, from Azets, partner Tim Milt, and from CG Professional, Managing Partner, Ben Dredge. Uh, gentlemen, welcome, welcome, nice to see you all. Um, can I ask you this, something simply, Ben, what, what do you hope to get out of today's session? What do you hope to learn? I would have thought probably anyone who's um, dialing in or, or um, joining us today probably wants to um, hear from people's experience of being through doing a deal. Um, uh, and that's obviously something they're going to get with the entrepreneurs that are joining you. Um, but hopefully from myself, from Tim and Mark, um, just some, obviously some tips, something to, to, to help take some mystery out of the whole process um uh and and also probably um our knowledge of, of, of probably what happens when things uh, start off on the wrong foot or, or or just simply don't go the right way and uh if we can help them uh in that situation all the better thank you very much mark what would you expect your takeaway from today's session to be uh, i think one of the positives of uh, events like this is they do raise awareness uh, and I think one of the things that I would like to see or get out of uh, this event is to, to make sure that business owners are aware of the uh, support services that are there and available to businesses, both public and private sector. Thank you very much. And it, and it is a, it's, a, it's a broad field, isn't, isn't it, Mark? It's, it, there's, a, there's a lot there we can go at. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And sometimes it's an old cliche, but uh, businesses don't know what they don't know. So hopefully we can uh, shed a little bit of light on what support is out there and help them realise their ambitions. Thank you. And Tim, you've got a huge amount of experience in this field. And I wonder what 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 would you, would you like to know? Are, are there things you learn on a day to day basis when you're working on these these kinds of projects? Do you continue to develop? 
Yes, definitely. You know, most deals do follow a similar pathway, um, no, no matter the size. However, each deal is totally different and there's different obstacles along the way. In, in the current environment, clearly people are working differently. But I think my takeaway today or what I'd like to get across is there's been some real difficulties in the last 12 months now with where we, the way we're working and what's, it, what, what's happening in the world. However, there are a lot of businesses and people who are actually you know, doing very well. And I think the key thing is that, you know, there's a positive message out there on top of everything that's going on to say that deals are still being done and businesses <laughs> are still, you know, actually able to perform even in, in difficult circumstances that we're seeing now. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mark, Tim and Ben. We'll be hearing more from our professionals later in the morning. But first, our first interview today is with John Flood, who's the Commercial uh, and Strategy Director, and with Paul Fox, who is the Group Managing Director of Fox Brothers. Paul has been with the business for more than 20 years. He's responsible for the overall management and the strategy of the Fox Group, and he was instrumental in securing the acquisition of Clive Hurt Plant Hire in September. Uh, John joined Fox Brothers a year ago, bringing with him a wealth of experience in private equity-backed and PLC businesses, having spent more than 20 years at Enterprise before joining Kia Group and more, more recently providing consultancy to Quadrilla, excuse me, Quadrilla Resources and Aggregate Industries. He worked very closely with Paul on the Clive Hurt deal. Gentlemen, welcome to you today. How are you both? Morning, Richard. We're very well, thank you. Morning, Richard. Good, thanks. Great stuff. I mean, Paul, if I may start with you, Paul, um, the deal which saw Fox acquire Clive Hurt, one of the biggest in the county last year. Can you tell us, Paul, a little bit, because I know there's a quite a bit of background. Can you tell us some of the background to that deal, Paul? Um, Clive Hurt was Fox Brothers' main competitor, um, although we work closely together um, and, you know, know each other well enough. Uh, the management team were getting where they wanted to retire and it was going to be put on the market. So as it being our biggest competitor, us running, you know, 80-odd wagons, um, over at Blackpool, um, we thought, well, if someone else gets it, um, that would be a shame. So we had, we basically had a look at it and thought, well, if we if we get hold of it, we will get, you know, the market share of the area, have more control, uh, and also expand our, you know, service range to our clients. Um, so it was a it was a passing conversation um, from Clive to myself. I went away for a couple of weeks, had a think, um, and then we got the ball rolling when we when we decided it was what we wanted to do. Thank you. Um, how many deals of this nature have you been involved with, Paul? Um, this was the first one. And I think that's one of the things it's, it's worth bearing in mind, isn't it? The um, the idea of, of um, for a lot of people, this is the, they will do this just once. But I guess for you, John, slightly different. You've been involved in this, this corporate environment. And I guess, is that one of the reasons you were brought into the business this time last year? Um, that was partly the reason. I, I think Paul's conversations with Clive was a catalyst uh, and Paul basically said bearing in mind I've probably done in excess of 30 to 40 acquisitions while, while I was part of enterprise and they range from extremely small ones to large private equity backed deals. Uh, Paul basically said yes uh, can you give advice direction and practical advice more so than anything else in terms of because it's because it's Paul's first effectively trying to uh, deal with the trials and tribulations and probably one of the first conversations I had with Paul was to say look this will get you very emotional you're going to go yeah and experience a roller coaster ride and and even this was before the pandemic so from that point of view he said you, you will go you'll have good days you'll have bad days and it's making sure that you're actually able to deal with that and sometimes stand back and actually say right how to actually I think one of the other guys said about dealing with uh, your trials and tribulations and obviously looking at how we actually deal with them on a daily basis. And I wonder if Paul, if you could explain to us a little bit, we've brought together businesses here that um, have some crossover, but they're not, they're not exclusively competitive, I, I don't think, but they have some crossover, but you have created a business that's a 50 million pound business. That seems to me to have some strength in a sector that it, it could well um, go very well later in the year. Is that how you view it? Yeah, I, th I think with with the Hurt acquisition, if you, if you look at Hurt as a business and Fox, Fox is predominantly haulage now and in, you know, in construction, so muck shifting, aggregates, recycling. Fox didn't, didn't do plant hire as such, but it ran its own fleet of machines for 
doing heavy earthworks jobs and such like. So we did enabling works on the uh, Preston Western distributor road. Those were the type of jobs we took on. The Fox skill set, the remediation and earthworks um, is quite good. Uh, we have good experience of it. But the Hurt plant fleet um, was a lot more varied than our plant fleet. So what <laughs> bringing the two together, it enabled us to take on bigger earthworks, remediation, demolition jobs. Yeah, the infrastructure of, of Hertz through um, different locations, depots, quarries, means we can we're more self-sufficient when we're pricing these these type of works, which we can you know try and focus on. Um, the extended plant fleet meant we can, like I say, we can do more work at Fox, but the Fox skill set means we can make more of the planting equipment at, at the, within the Hertz fleet. Thank you. Um, John, I, look, looking at your perspective of that, that sort of wide perspective of, of having done a number of deals of this nature, what were you keen on? What, what made you think, let's put it this way, what did you feel were the benefits to both businesses in this conversation? The benefits, as Paul's probably outlined to Fox, was that I think greater capacity, as you, as you said before, Richard, in terms of looking at um, the kind of projects that we, we wish to bid for, size actually does matter. And I think in terms of size and capability, so looking at sort of the, you know, uh, and, and again, even before the uh, pandemic struck in March, it, it was very clear that there was political will after the election to to look at you know the the agenda regarding infrastructure projects particularly in the north and uh, the midlands and we wanted to be ready placed to actually benefit from those as a tier two contractor to maybe a tier one contractor and a tier one contractor is obviously your larger companies like balfour beaties whether it be volkers etc um, so we'd be better placed as fox to actually have that kind of broader uh, capability Similar in terms of Hertz, looking at that kind of broader capability and probably agility as much as anything else in terms of Hertz was very centralised in, in Lancashire, whereby Fox actually did work outside of the Lancashire region as well. So blending that, to, that together and with the people, because effectively in terms of the acquisition, the acquisition basically created a business that employed over 320 people. And that kind of experience, looking at sort of competencies in, on blue collar and, you know, effectively in terms of operatives and in terms of staff, just made it a ready-made fit in terms of elevating both businesses up that kind of scale to be a, you know, a bona fide tier two contractor. I think um, one of the things I'm interested in, fellas, if I, if I may, is, is um, clearly Paul, Paul your, your name's on the tin, Paul, but it's Paul Fox, Fox Bros. Um, so I'm thinking, was there, was there ever any clash points between your vision, Paul, your, your vision for bringing these businesses together, growing this, 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 um, this powerhouse of, uh, uh, in the sector in Lancashire, was there a clash between that vision and a more perhaps pragmatic approach that, uh, John was perhaps bringing to bear and possibly even the prof services, uh, community was bringing to bear. I wonder if you could talk us through that dynamic a little bit, Paul. I think the best, I'll just describe John's, John and I's relationship. I run the day and chase round, yeah, doing what I need to do. And John is the gatekeeper and keeps us on the straight and narrow. So I might be running at 100 mile an hour. John is there just thinking, well, hang on, you know, we can't run at 100 mile an hour with this one. We just need to slow up a little bit, plan it, make sure it works, then deliver it. I mean, obviously, yeah, there's things we disagree on, um, and that will always be the, be the way. But if if one of us disagrees, there is a reason for it. Um, but on the whole, there was no no serious clashes, was it? It was like, well, we, we'll get to the same end game, but let's just go down this avenue as opposed to that avenue. And I think the Richard, I think I think the acquisition process um, did actually draw out that kind of sometimes sort of maybe sort of take a step back. And as I said before about the, you know, again, doing deals of this size uh, by the very nature can be quite emotional. And bearing in mind Clive Hurt, who was obviously the, the principal shareholder of Clive Hurt Plant Hire, um, Clive had been in the business for 40 plus years. So in that sense, he was very emotionally attached to the business. He'd done brilliantly in terms of growing the business. And he also wanted to see the business actually flourish. You know, he didn't effectively want to just sell the business and forget about it. So from that point, in terms of dealing with that, 
and dealing with probably the the personal aspects, I don't think sometimes can be overlooked. And you know, in terms of making sure that the deal is right for the own the current owner of the business, never mind the future owner of the business, um, is actually very important. And I suppose linking that in with you know the professional advisors, obviously in terms of our legal advisors, our funding advisors, obviously our funding partner, it was making sure that everything fitted together that said we do it at the right time, we do it at the pace that we're comfortable with. We also actually do recognise the owner's interest as well, because even though you know Clive was selling the business, he retained that interest in the business in terms of that, that tie to the business. And it was very important for us to fully understand that to make sure that all the ingredients of the deal were actually done correctly. Thank you. I wonder if you can tell me what impact, uh, Paul, did the pandemic have on getting the deal over the line? We were, we were due to complete for the 31st of March. Um, you know, it was a perfect storm, really. And obviously, the pandemic hit, you know, a week before we went on to lockdown. You know, we could, we could see it coming, but we, we hadn't felt any effects of work slowing down um, in either business, you know, through through February and certainly even into sort of a third week of March. So we were still we were still pushing and pushing and pushing. But on that second, third week of March, we, we were starting to think, you know, let's just see how this plays out. So obviously the day, you know, we went into lockdown. So look, we're just gonna have to press pause here for, you know, a month or two months and just see see what see what unfolds. So um, and we were pretty much at a point there where we we, we could have completed. There wasn't a lot more due diligence to do, uh, and then obviously we hit pause for what two months, John. Two months, yeah. Yeah, and it was literally just said we we're, were in the office and said, look, let's just pick this up and run with it again. I'm, I'm happy, but things are going to get rolling again. Fox had got back to you know good utilisation. We knew Hertz was was getting busy again, and it was just a case of we pick the phone up and said, "Look, let's try and get this done." And then, sure enough, we uh, we did. Obviously, there was a few issues with, you know, funders wanting to readdress forecasting and such like because the forecasts we'd done were, you know, pre the pandemic. So and the ones we had to do were post the pandemic. So there was it was a bit more work to do. We'll probably have half as much work to do again, but we uh, we picked it up again and, and got it done. And we had to demonstrate. We had to demonstrate, Richard. Sorry, the um, obviously the the move out of the uh, pandemic. <clears throat> obviously, our services are directly related to the construction industry. So we had that period, um, certainly May, the, the end of May, June, July, August, where we could actually demonstrate that we were back to um, pre-pandemic capacity. So that was important in terms of, from a funding point of view, in terms of we'd reached that steady state. And that was then the catalyst for effectively the finalisation of the, the, the forecasts and all the financial um, issues relating to the, to the acquisition, which basically then moved us into the final elements of the legal due diligence process. And then the, obviously the execution, which was in September. So it, it did take three months to actually sort of work its way through in terms of obviously making sure that, you know, we did, both companies actually fully recovered from uh, obviously the uh, March, April lockdown. So it was effectively five or six months behind the schedule. And, and I right. guess, I guess we'll, we'll take that, will we? That, that wasn't so bad. Yeah. <clears throat> no, we were comfortable with that. We, um, every, all parties understood it. Um, so from that point of view, all parties could see, could see that everyone was willing to actually, you know, expedite the deal as quickly as possible, but they understood that there were constraints and those constraints had to be managed through, which which we did through you know June, July, and August. Thanks very much, um, and I hope. Uh, thank you, John Jones, for sending us a question, which took us to to that point. Um, but I have another question as well from our, our audience, fellas. Uh, this is from Paul Lainsco, who will be joining us shortly. Um, Paul would like to know how did you uh, put to the finance together for this deal? Um, our funding partner is Close Brothers. So in terms of, we had a pre-existing relationship with Close Brothers and effectively effected that in February of 2020. We then obviously sort of finalized the deal uh, in terms of now the structure of the deal uh, was based on uh, primarily asset finance. So from that point of view, in terms of looking at effectively uh, assets plus goodwill. So, we valued the assets, we looked at the past 
performance of the business. We looked at the future forecasting performance of the business and effectively, obviously in terms of consideration, we calculated it from effectively those two elements. Thank, thank you very much. And, and to both of you, and if I can start please with, uh, with John on this one. What did you, again, you've, you've been through a number of these processes, but what did you learn by going through this process um, with Paul? What, what was your learning from, from this one? There's many hours in the day, Richard. Utilise every minute. And whether it be at 10 o'clock at night or two o'clock in the morning, uh, utilise it. I think one of the key things with this was balance, because obviously we still had a business to run yeah. and making sure that we had a business to run and actually you know manage an acquisition at the same time was challenging but we did it and we did it because you know again actually utilizing time and making sure that through the the power of you know we didn't have much face-to-face -face contact we had to do everything over zoom or teams and again learning from that i think one of the key elements to really learn and it really sort of was absolutely at the forefront of this was understanding the business owner that is selling yes and making sure that again in terms of understanding and not just obviously the financial elements and as i said before the the emotional attachment the real drive in terms of making sure that that person does fully respect and fully buy into what you're planning to do for the business was really important i think the selection of advisors and making sure that the advisors are bought in. Our legal advisors are great, um, you know, from that point of view. But I think sometimes you can actually rely on the advisors too much and actually dealing with uh, either the owner or maybe the owner's right-hand person is actually critical to make sure that, effectively, I think Paul used the terminology previously when we had discussions, oil in the wheels. And it's actually a good, it's a good term to actually explain it, that you've got to actually make sure that if you're on a tight timeline, if you, you want to use the best use of your time, you want to make sure that you're actually speaking to the right people at the right time with the right questions and they, you get the right answers at the, the right time. And sometimes, again, it can get lost in, you know, third party conversations, which can actually delay things. I'm not saying, I'm, yeah, from our point of view, it worked better for us to actually have that direct contact. <coughs> I don't. I don't know about. Um, I don't know about you, but Paul Fox. But if 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 I was in your spot, trying to bring together a business that was worth about fifty million quid, I'd want someone like John Flood sitting next to me. But I wonder if, from your perspective, what did you learn about yourself and about your business through this process, Paul? Well, just one thing I will say, I, I, just about John quickly. I had I had had him in my sights for quite a while, and it, it did take some persuasion to get him on board, but it. You know, a deal wouldn't have happened without him. No, absolutely, no doubt about it. Um, what did I le learn about it? The deal. <laughs> when we went into it, how I saw how we saw it going. Like I say, there was there was ups and downs all the way through it. And I think um, whenever there is an issue looming, as John just said, don't go through the advisors. Pick the phone up and just hit it head on and say, "Look, this is a problem. What are we going to do?" You know, and do it direct with the with with the uh, with the seller because it just gets lost in translation. Otherwise, and um, what would you advise to others, Paul, who might be going through it for the first time, like yourself? Uh, be sure it's a good, be sure it's a good business. Don't buy anything distressed, um, and make sure you drink a lot of coffee because you know it was yeah. more than twelve hours in a day. <laughs> and we're we're almost done for this. I'm just gonna. I've got a couple of questions here from our friends in the audience. Um, this is from Rick Patterson at Wesley Consulting. Rick asks, did you have to make any big, adjust, excuse me, big adjustments within Fox Brothers uh, to help with the integration? And in particular, particular uh, Rick is asking about people, processes and governance. Did you have to make adjustments to people, processes and governance to make it a, 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 a worthy project? I think the way Fox Brothers is is ran, it's a very analytical business. There is reports and reports for everything. And we probably didn't realise just how organised we did have it until we started spending more time on, on, on the deal. So although I'm still very involved and John is with the with you know the day-to-day -day strategy of Fox Brothers, the actual team we've got there is, is is very strong. We know what has to be done. 
So as long as that information flows to us, we, you know, we're fine. Now, we probably didn't realise just how good, you know, those, set, those systems and that setup was until, until we did the deal. If it hadn't have been as it was and, and set up like it is with, you know, the app, with the reports and the systems, we wouldn't, <laughs> we would have had to make some changes before we sort of stepped over over here to be involved and, you know, not spend as much time running that, but, you know, do the deal. Understood. Um, just move, moving along with this, um, Azim Khan asks uh, from Gemini, Azim asks, uh, why this business and why not another business? And I think there are straight, some straightforward answers to that perhaps you'd like to share with us. Why this business, obviously, as Paul said before, um, strong competitor. Um, there was obviously an historical connection in terms of obviously those kind of business developing at the same time. Uh, complementary, uh, as we said, in terms of particularly the third party plant hire and looking at the heavy machinery and effectively that kind of strong Lancashire base. We, we always, you know, again, we've, all, we've both got strong links to Lancashire. We could see that bringing those two Lancashire businesses together and developing this 15 million pound business both in Lancashire and outside the Lancashire area, uh, gave us great opportunities for expansion. And those those kind of sort of um, opportunities for expansion are already here and now, in terms of, again, allowing, a good, allowing us access to different levels of clients. So in that sense, you sort of look at it and, you know, it is very, it's a strong local business, but it's got a, certainly beyond Lancashire reach. And that's what we wanted. Thank you very much. And finally, gentlemen, um, this question is from Kenny Stevenson at Blackpool Skip Hire. Kenny wants to know, uh, have you plans to open more depots? Yeah, we're, uh, we're currently setting one up in Cumbria, Carlisle. Uh, we've got a, a depot there. We'll be up and operational 1st of March. Um, we've got machines, wagons ordered to, to head up there. Um, so that's we're just going through the legals now with the land and such like and operator's license. Um, we also have a depot in Anglesey, which we're looking to um, expand and make more of. We have a you know a, plant, a modest plant fleet, typically down there, and also we're, we are going to be looking around the Midlands, as we, we currently do a lot of work around there now. So you know we're travelling. You know, yeah, this is this is this is really exciting. A growth story comes on off the back of it, gentlemen. Um, thank you ever so much for your time. If I can just um, four words, no six words that have really stuck with me as a part through that conversation. One is don't forget the emotional impact. I think that's fair. The second one is uh, communication is vital. And I think that covers all directions outside the business, inside the business with your, with your advisors and with your close advisors, get your systems in order. If, and, and I think that's quite interesting, Paul, you're saying that you, your systems were much better than you thought they were, which is, which is I think quite interesting. Do your homework. And I think finally, drink coffee, work hard, and stay up late. It's been an absolute pleasure to welcome our friends here from Fox Brothers. Congratulations to you on the deal, and we wish you all the very best going forward. Thank you very much for your time. Thank Cheers, you. Richard, thank you. All the very best to you. Our next panel, so in fact, our first panel, ladies and gentlemen, is coming right up. And this features business people who have done their fair share of deals as well. Would you please welcome Paul Harper, Janine Murray. Paul Ainsco and Matt Hurst. Paul Harper, more than 25 years experience in the tourism and hospitality industry. And for the past six, he's been the sales and marketing director for Dacious Holidays, based in Dorset, which recently acquired Great Harwood based Robin Robinson's Holidays. And for anybody in East Lancashire, you can't have ever had a point in your life when you haven't seen that brand driving around your streets. Um, Janine Murray joined the Daisy Group group in 2009. She is now the Mergers and Acquisitions Director at this Nelson-based business telecoms and IT giant. Janine has overseen more than 30 acquisitions. Paul Ainsco set up his first business in his early 20s. He studied to become a chartered accountant, moved into the corporate world, got fed up with the corporate world and the politics and the bureaucracy, returned to the SME sector to establish and to buy five small businesses, including Eden Play, a playground supplier, uh, a playground equipment supplier, 
uh, in Ormskirk and more businesses are planned. Now, Matt Hurst is the CEO of leading energy technology provider ESG, which has over 500 staff and operations in North America, Japan and the UK. He masterminded the 2014 MBO of Utility Group Brackets, a brand which was retired on January the 1st this year, close brackets, backed by the private equity firm North Edge Capital. Utility Group was acquired by Excel, Axel KKR, backed ESG in 2017, then Matt assumed a position on the ESG board, continued to run the UK operation uh, of Utility Group, now rebranded as ESG, before becoming global CEO of the ESG Group in July 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, that is too many acronyms. Simply put, Matt is in charge at ESG. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our panelists. Um, where are we? So um, I wonder if I could start with this. And if I could send this to you, Paul Harper. Um, what made you attracted by this purchase, Paul? Well, I think there was a number of, uh, of aspects to this purchase. We, along with Robinson's Holidays, also uh, bought two hotels within the, the purchase, uh, including the Imperial Hotel in Eastbourne, which was a, a destination that we, we very much wanted, uh, and a hotel down in Torquay as well, which is already a destination that we, that we had a hotel in, but again, gave us a different option. Um, and then for the, the, the Robinson's brand side of things, uh, it gave us a very good stronghold uh, and, and route into the market of the Northwest, which is an area where Dacia's had uh, sort of attempted to get into previously, but not particularly well. Um, and, you know, the Robinsons brand is very strong, uh, very strong customer database. We know the client database is very similar to that of our, of our Dacia's customers. Um, so the whole thing just fit really, really well. Uh, and from our point of view, going into a new area, it's you know it's far easier to to, to get a new coach route and, and new pickups in place when you've got something to start with, rather than going from from scratch. Really. Now this deal, Paul, you'll be, you're based on the south coast. This this deal completed concluded was it September? Uh, November. November. So this deal concluded in November. So the the work towards this deal was done through, f frankly, a period where your businesses stood still. Stopped. Yes. Yeah, we originally, uh, we, we started the conversations back in sort of January, February time. Uh, then obviously March and the pandemic hit and, and uh, you know, as, as per sort of the Fox Brothers deal, we sort of hit pause, uh, although ours was, was probably paused slightly longer uh, until kind of July time when we were able to reopen. Um, and then we looked again at it. Um, we, we kind of broadly expected a, a tough winter. Uh, which I think we've all, you know, possibly underestimated how tough it's actually been. Uh, but then we were, we, we, we're still sort of very much of the opinion that going forward into the summer and this year and then beyond, um, the demand is very much going to be there. Uh, and one of the largest or the, or the largest operator in our market, which was Special Assessor Group, which owned Shearings and stuff, went into administration. So has left a very big hole in, in the market. So we sort of thought, well, actually, it's, it's you know, the opportunity, all, all the rationale of why we wanted to acquire the business to, to start with was still there. Um, you know, you'd, you'd possibly say acquiring two hotels and coach business in the middle of a worldwide pandemic when you can't operate any of them is somewhat risky but i think you know we we, we have to take a view beyond the, the the short term and you know our, our view and, and and desire to expand and grow the business is, has still been been the case and that's that's where we why we decided to continue i think paul you'll, you'll appreciate and i'm sure you'll agree with me that lancashire is the center of the universe yeah definitely. so when we're considering that as an idea um I think we're, in, we're always intrigued about why people come to our businesses and look at businesses in Lancashire and maybe sometimes they're in distress, but no, I don't think you know, that was the case. You just, you, you were looking at your portfolio. I wonder what impressed you about the Robinsons operation and how much will be retained as you move forwards? So the Robinsons operation is, is, was quite different to, to how we operated the Dacia side of things. Uh, we, we, for example, didn't have a, a base or a garages to operate. We've got a, a fleet of, of 26 coaches. 
uh, whereas the Robinsons has that base, uh, which we will, we will be maintaining. Um, they will operate slightly differently uh, because of the geographical location and you know, obviously the travel time from, from our coach routes in the Midlands down to the south coast is far less than sort of from the northwest and, and places, so that will operate differently. But I think one of the, the, the big things that struck us with the Robinsons deal was, was not only the brand and, and the knowledge um, or, and recognition uh, of the brand, but also the passion for the brand within the company. Uh, you know, you speak to all of the employees that we've got, uh, that we've inherited, that we've tubed over, they're all very passionate about the, the brand. Many of them have been there for many, many years. Um, you know, and, and one of our fitters in the garage, his his father was a fitter and his father before him was a fitter. So, you know, it, it's that there is a huge amount of, of loyalty. And I think we, we were in a position where, where we purchased Robinson's I think there was quite a lot of concern from the employees as to what would happen in the future. Um, you know, it, it was a brand that had owned previously a lot more hotels than it did at the time. It, it was only decreasing. And I think there, there was concern as to, well, actually, if the, if the last couple of hotels are sold, well, where does that then leave the coaching firm? Um, so I think that, that the employees, um, you know, were, were very pleased that actually we've come in and purchased it because we, we have a desire for the hotels as well as the, the coaching firm and, and the and the brand, so it secures their their future and gives us a very good um, slingshot into you know the northwest and and also as a staging point to maybe start doing routes down from Scotland and pickups from from further abroad as well. So it, it you know not only opens up the Lancashire market but then other areas in the north as well. Thank you very much, Paul. And I, I was told last night my cousin works for Robinsons, which I didn't know. So yeah. um, I, good luck to all, all who sell in that happy ship. Uh, Matt Hurst, welcome to you, Matt. Um, we've, we've watched your business and we've watched you with interest over the years, an awful lot of acquisitions, an awful lot of movement in the business. What, what, is, it, what is it, Matt? What, what do you look for when you are on the acquisition trail? And I think what I'm trying to do is, is frame this a little bit for our, our audience. And I think sometimes it's it's coming up with the first idea. So where do you where does your thinking start, Matt? Well, we, we're constantly assessing um, businesses that we can potentially acquire, and you know already this year we've we've walked away from a couple that that looked fairly good, and we got into exclusivity on. And I think one of the key things that the, the, that John and Paul touched on earlier was you know working with the corporate finance advisor. So you know when we've gone into process ourselves looking for investors to get that advisor on board early to make sure that you've got your house in order. And I'm certainly seeing from the acquisitions that we're making that people are not doing that. So when we're presented with the, the initial information, it looks great. And then when you start to get into the weeds, it starts to unravel a little bit. And that's what will really unnerve a buyer like ourselves. So what is that, Matt? Is it just a lack of preparation? Is it is it uncertain management structures? What what, what is it that makes you go, ooh, not so sure anymore? Yeah, preparation and and you know not not quite truthful about some of the things going on in the business, some of the dynamics, some of the the, the story behind the figures. And what what's next for the group, Matt? What where, where, where are you looking next? What what do you what do you feel you're missing within the organisation that's going to come on next? Well, as you mentioned at the outset, we're already in three geographies. We're you know, big player in the UK, providing software to energy retailers, metering companies, the likes of Ovo Energy and Eon. Uh, we're big in North America. We've got over 100 customers there. We've, we've launched in Japan. That's going really well, but it's still a fledgling business. And we're looking at more international expansion, particularly into Europe and, and other destinations in the Far East. And those ambitions are not quelled by the circumstances around us? Well, clearly, it makes it makes it more challenging. You know, as, as you mentioned in, in the in the bio piece, I, I assumed uh, responsibility for America and Japan, and I've not been able to visit because of the pandemic. Um, it's not necessarily an issue for North America. I've been there a lot of times. I've met the team already, but doing business in Japan is very different, and it's not a place I've ever been to before. And that you know, I do feel that that is hindering me a little bit, and particularly when we're looking at other geographies in the east. It would be nice to hop on a plane and obviously that's not something we can do at the moment it'd be nice to hop on a plane if it was just you i reckon that'd be all right i'd buy that i'll come back to you shortly matt thank you very much um paul Ainsco, uh, welcome to you paul good morning are you well very well thank you good i mean i described you as um you just sound like you're fed up with the corporate world. <laughs> that was, there was a lovely bit of stuff. I didn't make that up, ladies and gentlemen. That did get sent to me. I might have added a couple of lines, but um, but you know, you, you, it's this small business. What is it about you and small business, Paul? 
Yeah, I think uh, slightly different to some of the other guests you've had, um, which are more like corporate expansion type um, purchases. I look at it a lot more from a personal perspective and what do I want out of it long term for my personal, personal life, personal future, kids future. Um, and it's about, for me, buying, uh, starting up small businesses and having multiple income streams in, in very varied businesses. Um, slightly different from some advice that um, Paul Flood gave in, the, in your previous interview that um, I think there's opportunity in distressed businesses and I'm quite happy to take those on. Uh, we're actively looking at the moment. Uh, we've got a, you know, a nice uh, pot of capital there to, to invest, but equally I'm happy to start something up from scratch. So it's, it's very much more about you know, looking at my long-term future, having asset-based businesses that are growing so that I can retire when I want and I can do what I want, rather than coming from the view of expanding a corporate business. And are you, do you have any passion for any particular sector? Or is it just a passion for starting and growing small businesses? Uh, it's more general business. However, I, I do have quite an interest in property. Um, I've, I've based businesses on, a, on buying a, an old pub and changed the use and, and built a business from that. I also acquired some land with this and built houses on it. Um, but equally, uh, we've bought a, uh, well, we, we bought a distressed uh, joinery firm massive overhead, uh, put the overhead actually by purchasing a commercial property, reduced the, the overhead by a quarter and uh, grown the business from there quite successfully. So uh, a multiple of ranges, uh, to be honest. So it is interesting. We've got, we've got people, we've got some guests who've never done this before. They've done it once. Some people have done it dozens of times. And I think to our, to our audience, I think what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is it doesn't matter where you are, what kind of business you're in and what kind of angle you're taking these options are available to every business if if it's a pursuit you want to go down and i wonder janine murray you know, you've overseen 30 odd transactions in your time at, um, at 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 daisy what what keeps the motivation going to keep developing what is already a massive organization janine um, well, it probably would help if I explain a little bit about Daisy's history um, to, to, and, and the business to, to help you understand that. So Daisy was set up, must be about 20 years ago now, by um, a Lancashire lad, actually, um, born and bred in Nelson. Um, he set it up in his garage. He, he saw that a lot of the big telecom network operators didn't really focus on providing quality services for the small medium-sized businesses they wanted to deal with big clients so the customer service side wasn't very good um, and they were charging them an, an awful lot of money so he saw um, a, a gap in the market whereby he, if he could be the intervening player he could buy from these big large network operators and provide that extra customer service to, to them better quality service at, at a better price um, so, so he did just that, and that's how Daisy set up. And he found that actually, the bigger he was, the bigger the business got, the better pricing he was able to get from his suppliers, that he was then able to pass on to his customers to a certain extent and improve his margins. So to, to springboard the growth of the business, it was all about acquisitions. So he would, he would buy in the telecom sector um, bring the operations, the headquarter operations back to Nelson uh, and therefore cut back on a lot of the costs, achieve a lot of synergies um, and carry on providing that great service to its customers. So that, that was Daisy's history um, and, and Daisy has continued to evolve through acquisitions. Um, it was very much at fixed lines and calls, which you know has now gone into mobiles, data, and the cloud, which is obviously the growth market and, you know, the use of Teams and, and um, Office 365 is, is now part of a way of life for all of us. And, and so, sorry. So, so that, that's the acquisitions are very much part of our strategy and continue to be so. So at the minute, you know, what, what, what kinds of things are you looking at at the minute? Where, where are you looking to bolster the business next? Well, very much in the cloud space, that's the, the growth market areas. We're not using our traditional phone lines and calls anywhere near as much as we used to. You know, offices are not in operation as much as they used to be. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're very much focused on the cloud. We're wanting complementary products and services to what we're delivering um, and providing that 
cross-sell opportunity to our customer base so that they have the benefit of a, multi a multitude of services, They're not just buying the, the telephone calls and lines, it's the whole IT package that we yeah. can now provide them. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder, again, what I'd like to get to is some of the, sort of the realities of the, 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 the gritty stuff. And I wonder if you could perhaps, if I asked you all the same question, what have you learned and where, where did the pain points come? So if I may start with you, um, Paul Ainsco, you've done this several times as an individual rather than as a corporate. What, what, where were your key pain points and how, how might we advise uh, our audience who may be considering buying and selling for the first time? Um, where do you start? Um, Big question. Yeah, so so the key for me is uh, you must have a plan. So why are you buying the business? There must be an objective, a long-term objective. So be it to sell it, be it to uh, expand it, grow it, be it to scale it down, whatever whatever that is. And then obviously the key process is going through the purchase. It, the big one is finance, obviously, particularly for um, an individual or a small business. You know, I've gone through, I've, I've uh, put things on credit cards, I've remortgaged my house, I've gone through all that. And that is hugely stressful, especially when you've got a family as well. So you've got to balance that risk, um, get, the, get the cheapest money you possibly can. Um, often that's a mortgage, but I, I personally would only ever um, use mortgage finance uh, to then invest yourself if, if you're buying something with an, an asset based. So that fundamentally you've got something to sell later on. So you've got to be really careful, get really good advice, uh, read as much as you can, um, watch seminars um, and learn about business. There, there, there are so many tricks coming up, but you, and, and I think Paul Flood alluded to it earlier, understand the numbers. You've got to understand the numbers of the business that you're acquiring. Uh, and, and from there, you can, you, can, you can form a strategy. You know, do I want to buy it fundamentally? And then what, what am I going to do with that business? Because as I say, even distressed businesses, if you understand the numbers, understand the business, do your due diligence, there's opportunity there. I think as Matt said a couple of minutes ago, you know, understand the numbers, then I think dig a bit deeper, I think is, is perhaps the best advice that, that's coming out to Absolutely. me here. Um, Matt Hurst, I wonder if you could share something. Can you share with us a mistake you've made in this field and how we might avoid this, a similar mistake? I think, um, you know, I can, I can answer the question from two ways. One is where we're looking for investment ourselves and one is where we've made acquisitions. And I think what's probably most relevant is where we've been the ones out, you know, did a management buyout in 2014. We then sold the business to ESG in 2017. I think they're the biggest learnings for me. And, you know, we spoke just then about the numbers, getting the corporate finance advisors on board. I think one of the things that's overlooked uh, by some organizations is the people side you're particularly you know with a really strong management team like mine and it, it's a little bit like a football team where you know, you've got people at different stages of the career um people more experienced and you know perhaps wanting to get off the bus at the next time and it it's planning for those things because you know if you pitch to a new investor at the sort of level that we're at and we say you know this is our team and they'll say, well, you know, what, what about this guy or girl? You know, they, they want to retire in a couple of years. And you need to plan for that. You need to make sure that you've got your succession plan and you're presenting the team as it's going to be. And you can prove that you've developed those people over a couple of years in anticipation for that. And I think a lot of people do overlook that succession planning piece. Thank you very much. Uh, Janine Murray, I'll come to you again. And I wonder if, I'd like to frame this question slightly awkwardly, I think, but... Um, when you are look, when you're looking at businesses, and you're, you're either going to take a look, you're going to pass on an opportunity, or you're going to pursue an opportunity. For for friends out in our audience who, who may be considering selling their business, what's the best advice you can give them to prepare their business ready for somebody like you, who is on an acquisition hungry operation? I would say, um, firstly, get get a good advisor on board. I think this is was mentioned earlier. I think uh, an advisor who can help you plan accordingly. A, a disposal process is never simple and, and straightforward. It's 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 a minefield. It's very complex, and the more you are prepped, the better off you will be to to maximise the value of of your disposal. Um, and you know you're going to get it's 
it's it's t it's a tough process you know you're going to get an awful lot of questions um asked of you and you will you know you'll struggle to do your day job as well as you know you running the business and, and keeping the value in that business as well as answering all these questions but something matt said earlier you know resonates in that it's also very to me i think you you, you need to be truthful you need to be realistic and you need to be pragmatic so if you go in and just put everything with rose tinted glasses and just put everything that you think are the positives without being balanced and it, it'll come back to bite you because you'll go into exclusivity and it will do due diligence and it'll all come out in the woodwork and you'll lose the deal yeah. in my mind the advisor should be saying you know you obviously put it into it um, a, a light that's going to be able to sell your story but you shouldn't be afraid to to be honest because I, I i honestly think it will come back to bite you if you're not putting it out there up front i'm not but you know we've got four we've got four business buyers on this panel right now me with me, me with you four and i just don't think any of you are blaggable by a bunch of duff accounts i just i, I it strikes me what why would you do that prepare your business but don't, it's, it's don't about, blag it It'll, de it'll destroy the trust as well, though, Richard. Um, yeah. At, at that stage, and yeah, I think you know, all, all of our businesses have got. You know, we've had bumps in the road. We've had stuff happen. You know, we've had a you know, pandemic that no one foresaw uh, in the past twelve months. And you just need to, with your advisor, work out how how best to present the information and not to distort the information. Yeah, underst understood. Yeah. I've got, um, thank you all. I've got, a, I've got a question that's coming in from uh, Jonathan Finch at Sales Geek. I thought, so I, I'm going to reframe it a little bit. So you can acquire companies in, your, in the same market. You can acquire companies to grow a, a current client list. You can acquire companies to open up a new market and complement current services. Is it literally horses for courses? Is it all those things are valid? at a particular time in a particular circumstance, uh, Paul Ainsco? Yeah, I think so. Um, it depends on your corporate goals. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're a holiday business, you, you probably want to focus on that market. Me personally, I find it quite exciting to get into different markets so, and, buy, and acquire different businesses. It, it's, uh, it, it's down to whoever's driving the deal. It, it's probably their personal or shareholder, if it's a more of a corporate deal, uh, objectives. Thank you, Paul Harper. How how do you see it? We know we know why you went for the Robinsons deal. You've explained that. What 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 are you looking for next? Yeah, I mean, from our point of view, we we would stay within the same market. We've got a very successful business operation. Um, you know, we know what we do, how we repeat it, and how we scale it up. Uh, so, from our side of things, we would then be looking for other hotel acquisitions or other potential other coach operations that would be maybe northeast or Scotland way. That again would be you know. A, Add to um, add to the existing businesses we've got. Thank you very much. Um, we will get. I'm getting, being flooded with really good questions now. So, so another couple of questions from our audience. Uh, this is from John Jones at Bieber Struthers. Um, I'm going to ask you, Janine. Janine, has there been one that got away from you? Um, you mean one that we wanted that we never got? Yeah. Um, there was a deal actually that we um, we looked at in 2017 that I really liked. Um, it was a, a high deal multiple, um, and it was bought by private equity, and um, it was it provided teams to to, to other telecom resell sellers. Um, and actually, we bought it last year. It came back on the market. It was private. <laughs> And we got it. So, see, it escaped us for a short while, but not for long. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing gets away from Matt Riley for, for, for two. <laughs> Has anybody else got one? You know, the one that got away. Anyone want to give us another story there? Or the one you wish you hadn't bought? That'll do. Go for that one. <laughs> I'll have that one, Paul. No, not, not, not yet. Not yet. You have. You have. You're just not going to tell us. Um, and the last, the last one in, this is from Ian McCulloch at, uh, at Begbie's. Um, he wants us to just very briefly could consider the people side and seller apathy, the risks of a previous owner managers who disengage following completion. Matt, have you had that uh, situation? I think the, the trick here is to communicate well. So if, if you're selling, um, 
be really clear about all of the members of the team on what they want to do. You need you, you also need the buyer of your business to be really open with you about what the future holds. You know, if you're an entrepreneurial person like Paul, you're not going to thrive if you're acquired by Daisy and you've you know you're running a small business unit within it. You need to really be open with each other and and to plan for that. And you know, what does the future look like? You know, we're very open with the people that we acquire that will integrate them quickly. Um, it will become part of ESG and you know, we, we want those owners to stick around and sometimes they don't want to and we plan for that and we work with them on that. And But if they're not open with you or you're not open with them about the future, I think that's when the problems start. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this has been fascinating and you know we could go on all day, but I promised you that we'd finish in about, not all day. Um, ladies and gentlemen, would you please join us for a, a virtual round of applause uh, and thank Paul Harper, Janine Murray, Paul Ainsco and Matt Hurst. Thank you all for your time. Now we're moving into, excuse me, <coughs> we're moving into the second panel now. And, and this is where I would like you to meet the deal makers, the rain makers, the professionals who steer a course to the transaction. And with that in mind, would you please welcome Mark Gibbons, Tim Mills, and back to see us again, all three of them, Ben Dredge. Now, Mark Gibbons is the lead for the Access to Finance service in Lancashire, which provides fully funded support to businesses seeking to grow and seeking to raise finance. Tim Mills is partner in the corporate finance team at ASEX, business advisors and accountants. He advises on acquisitions, on, disposable, on disposals, exit planning and succession. He also works with MBO teams on structuring and negotiating deals and introducing funders for each deal. Uh, ben Dredge is managing partner at CG Professional, the corporate law specialist. He advises private companies, investors, owner-managed businesses and management teams on acquisitions and disposals, restructuring, reorganisations, joint ventures, shareholder agreements, investments and private equity. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome our friends from the professional services. And let me start with you, Tim Mills. Tim, where do you start when a client says, I want to buy or I want to sell? Where do you start? It's probably echoing some of the comments that have been made previously, Richard, in regards to just finding out what is the purpose of a potential acquisition or, or buying something, you know, and is there, is there a mix of, you know, strong businesses that are the targets? So, you know, corporates or mid-corporates that we deal a lot with in regards to being targets. Or a bit like Paul Ainsco was saying that, you know, he'd be happy to look at something a little bit more stressed. So, and what they're actually aiming to do is, is bolt on something or add to something that they possibly haven't got. So we always find out and spend some time with our clients to discuss what is it that you're actually looking for? Because often they'll come with a target in mind, but having had time to sit down and chat about what they're actually looking for, not just in, in, in this transaction that they might be looking at, but, you know, five, 10 years in advance, it might be that that target isn't necessarily the best one. You know, we can help them look at alternatives. But when, when, you, when you go through this process, I, I presume, you know, as a buyer, you wanted to add value to the organisation or the business that you're buying. So you've got to add value to generate value. Um, I, wonder, I wonder I wonder how we could look at this. Mark, when it comes to adding value, you've got that finance piece that comes in to support businesses. How does that work? I think it was mentioned a little bit earlier on that one of the key things to making a transaction work is having the appropriate finance in place. And um, my my sort of general view is that there's a number of different components that uh, normally come into play. Um, so with a target business, for example, you might be looking at leveraging some of the assets within there. So you might be looking at a number of different facilities. I think Close Brothers was mentioned at the outset you know, where it might be a combination of uh, invoice finance, it might be a combination of asset finance and maybe some external debt in order to make the, uh, the transaction happen. So normally there's a, there's a, a couple of solutions or a, a, a sort of composite solution that works for the business. Thank you very much. When, you know, we, we, we heard a lot about the value and the importance of the, the uh, professional services sector and the fact that uh, business people need to challenge their, their professional services uh, friends as well. Ben, what, what's, what's your perspective when people come at it? Where, where do you start? What, what's the first part of your process in this buying and selling mechanic? I think um, 
it was really useful and and i think you had a great panel um earlier but it was really useful to hear a lot of the 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 words that came out of that and one of the key things i think was was things like relationships personalities um and and, and the emotional side and i think for me one of the first things i do if i'm acting for a client on on, on the sell side so someone who's looking to sell their business is to understand them as individuals because at the end of the day um, a lot of what we do when we're acting for owner managed businesses is to allow them to achieve a, a milestone event. Um, so understanding them as a person actually, although it sounds twee, is, is incredibly important. Um, it can give you a heads up as to what things might become emotive or sensitive further down the process of a transaction. Um, and also you can build up a bit of a relationship so that hopefully you can build some trust between you and your your client and, 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 and start to understand what things we need to address early on. Um, so I think getting to know them fundamentally is, is, is crucial right from the outset. And Ben, does, does that, what you said there makes sense and it chimes absolutely with what uh, our friends from Fox were saying earlier about this emotional, um, this emotional elements. How, how far, you know, especially when you're dealing with people who've not done it before, how far can you explain in advance, listen, guys, ladies, it's going to be hard work as this, and it's going to be tough. How far can you get them down that line without putting them off? You, yeah, normally, once you get to the stage where you're having a conversation with a lawyer, you've, you've hopefully had input from people like Tim and, 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 and corporate finance advisors and, and, and so forth. So they'll, they'll have pre-warned you. But I think you know, it is your job as the lawyer to try and um, uh, prepare your client as best as possible. Um, if you have time, it, it's a real luxury and you need to engage with your advisors to, to get as much of a heads up as possible. We do try. Um, I think, you know, several of the contributors uh, uh, earlier have said it's a it's a tough process. Um, I think made all the tougher by the fact that a lot of our clients are owner managers and therefore have to spend all of their day um, managing their business uh, to then deal with with what is a huge event. Um, uh, and fitted around that. So we do try and prepare. I mean, I, the earlier I can get into a process, the better, because I will you know, be able to actually talk them through it all and, and, and try and give them as much of an opportunity to make their life easier and get their ducks in a row. Thanks very much. Um, Tim, when, you know, as part of your, your process, you love, let's, let's make the assumptions. You've, you've be, you have a deep understanding of your, your client's needs. Your, your client has expressed a desire to expand and part an acquisition, maybe one of the methods by which they're expanding or conversely, they may be planning to dispose of a business. Um, in either case, are you, once you've got that information, how helpful can you as a professional advisor be in terms of, have we thought about this target? Have we thought about that target? Have we thought about this method or that method? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a big part of our role with, with clients. And if we take, because they are slightly two different, obviously two extremes, so acquisitions and disposal. So if we take, if your first point is acquisitions, then it is really understanding, you know, almost a bit of the, you know, understand the background to the business. Where did it come from? You know, is it is it is it a business that's been built, you know, and grown organically? Or has it had bolts and acquisitions? Because if it has, then that will help because they'll have the experience of having done it, depending on what those, those were and what the size were. So understanding all of that helps with the acquisition side and then it is it's understanding what do they understand about the process because as it's been mentioned earlier by a number of the uh, panelists it is it is a it is a stressful process whether you're on the selling side or the acquiring side because there's you know there's lots of hoops in essence to jump through including due diligence and all the other elements so as well as being emotional it's time consuming and very stressful and all of those combined and it often is in a short period of time that these things happen, can build up to almost a head. And part of our role is to try and take that emotion away to some degree and say, it's going to be all right. We've been here before. We've done it before. We know what, what you're feeling. But also you're part of that kind of roller coaster ride with them. So you've got to have that empathy to say, yeah, we understand what you're going through, but trust us. You know, that's why we're here. We're here to help. And that helps on both sides. Disposals are a little bit more emotional because often the businesses have people who've worked in them for years and years. And so making sure that a deal structure is right to allow the, the sellers to think that we're not just disappearing, we might stay for around for a period of time, which is often what's required by acquirers, just helps that soften the, the blow to the emotional side of deals. You know, never mind the pounds and the pence, you know, there's people involved. With that in mind, 
let's move on to the pounds and pence. That that's a segue of the highest order, ladies and gentlemen. Please, um, like Mark. Your job is to provide the money options, or one of your jobs is to provide the money options to businesses in Lancashire who are seeking to do a variety of things, but acquisitions is one of them. How do I persuade you? How do I persuade you, Mark, to back me? Well, just to sort of give you a bit of background about what we do at Access to Finance, we're a free to access service um, funded by Lancashire County Council. And the real objective of the role really is to support businesses and help them obtain some funding. So um, we're there to help businesses of all shapes and sizes. Um, the question of convincing is mainly around the lenders or investors themselves. So part of the process for us really is to make businesses investment ready. Um, so that's a key component to what we do. Um, then the other half of the, the, the role really is once we've got we've positioned it we've shaped it is to take it to lenders or investors and i think this is the area where it can be a bit of a minefield and there's so many different funding options out there at the moment it, as an owner managed business they haven't really got the time to sort of wade through all the particular options so that's a a, a, a sort of massive usp i feel in what we do for our clients can and i just hold you one second mark can i just ask you one one thing you you used a phrase there and i'm aware of the phrase but i wonder if we can just explain what investment ready means yeah well investment readiness really means um getting the business in a shape where you can actually take it to a lender investor so in part, that will be looking at and interrogating the financials. It will be uh, preparing a business plan uh, with capital as well. So it's having that sort of complete picture that when a lender or investor is having a look at it, they've got a real good feel for the business itself. Um, and these transactions, uh, whether it's a straightforward lend or you, you, you're supporting a transaction, um, a lot of the key elements is around the information flow and the the accuracy of that information so when the panelists have talked about things popping up uh, out of the woodwork um, if, you, if these are dealt with earlier on during this investment readiness process it can make the whole process a lot smoother and, and that, that little bit quicker but it's all about the prep this is what i'm hearing this is all, all about the prep and, I, and ben i appreciate you say you, you come in a little bit later on this um but in terms in terms of the prep what's what's your what's your biggest contribution at this point in the process of the that, that final preparation stages? Um, yeah, I, I, I think as a lawyer, um, when you're going through this process, you know, there's, there's often a process where you sit down, um, uh, look your client in the eye and ask them the question is, is there anything we need to, to tell the other side, uh, we need to disclose and really you, you, you want the answer to be no I've told you everything um, because at that stage it's, it's it's often too late I mean some of the contributors early talked about um, trust being absolutely key from the buyer's perspective um, you don't want the buyer to find something out um, uh, um, themselves um, and you certainly don't want them to find out something um, uh, in the dying breath uh, of, of a transaction so um, uh, as I mentioned earlier having a relationship with your clients so that you can have a frank discussion um, because quite often things that, that seem horrendous you know disputes uh, contract issues if you can get in there early enough um, it, 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 it's often about framing it um, but also you can often nip it in the bud uh, and solve a problem before it becomes one. And again, so let's let's look. Let's let's put. I'm what I'm keen to push this idea of um, preparation. So if you look at it from the do, let's try and flip the question to a sort of more doomsday scenario. Um, Tim, what what activity, what piece of disclosure, what are the kinds of things that bring deal processes crashing? Um, <laughs> well, yeah, uh, probably lack I'm of literally trying to think, yeah. guy, I'm trying to think if, if, if this was me, what I'm asking for your advice, what do I absolutely not need to mess up? Yeah, and this will be, as Ben just touched on really, it's lack of preparation. So what you don't want is if you're, particularly if you're an acquirer, is looking at a business where you've been provided with information and there's a gap and you keep asking for the information, it doesn't appear. And all of a sudden the alarm bells start ringing. And at some point the information lands and it's not always, you know, doom and gloom, but to some degree you're right. It's kind of, well, 
the reason it wasn't there and wasn't available is because clearly something wasn't right. Um, but that shouldn't, on, on the seller side, that shouldn't happen because, as Ben said, really getting in as early as possible to get that preparation in place can deal with kind of the doom and gloom potential issues. You know, and if they are doom and gloom, then as Ben said, get them out, get, get them out open in the, in the beginning because you'll find that deals will often carry on continuing. They'll just be kind of done in a different way. You know, the, the structure will be changed. You know, earn out provisions will be put in rather than it being deferred or cash on day one to give that protection to the buyers. So there's ways that you can do it, but you need to you need to be aware of it. You can't deal with stuff that you're not aware of. So I think as um, it was touched on earlier by Janine, you know, just be honest. Be totally honest in in the in in, in the in the, the whole uh, deal uh, structure and what you're doing because that will get the best results. It really will. I can't help thinking thinking that uh, honesty will speed things up and save a bit of buggering about. Is oh, I beg your pardon, everybody. I hope that's okay in Lancashire. Um, here's the thing. So so over the course of the last year or so, things have changed. The markets have changed. Finance options are changing. We've had some, uh, frankly, very cheap money from the government uh, to help businesses over the last year. I'm presuming that's had an impact on the fi other finance houses. So I wonder if I could come to you, um, Mark, on this one. Tell us a little bit about, if you can, the way the finance options have changed and where businesses should look. Have we, are we really open to very, very many ideas now in our finance options? Yeah, well, I think uh, you, you've touched on it before when you're talking about the government-backed support, um, CL bills, C bills, and the bounce-back loans. So uh, what that has done is made uh, a lot of fairly cheap cash available and uh, hopefully readily available to businesses that need it. But the, the sort of flip side to that is that there's a lot of debt now that sits with businesses. And whilst that may not come to fruition just yet and uh, with extensions on repaying, uh, some of these facilities, that's, that still sits on the balance sheet. So in terms of what we're doing and looking at with, with customers and clients who approach us is, you know, how do they manage that going forward? You know, is additional debt suitable? Is it appropriate? Um, you know, we don't want it to, to sort of have businesses that are debt laden. So um, there is opportunities out there. And what we're finding at the moment is um, equity funding is quite a good option for those businesses that have got existing debt in place, but still gives them the opportunity to scale up and to grow as well. So equity funding, and if I, and if I may, Tim, I'm, I'm going to throw this out there. I don't think equity funding is desperately well understood by the owner manager community. Am I overstating it? I think it's fair. I think it's becoming more understood um, because I think people are becoming more um, finance and uh, option savvy, if that's the right terminology to use. Yeah. Um, and I think speaking to advisors who deal with private equity on a, on a much more regular basis, because over the last probably 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot more private equity options available, particularly in the Northwest. Um, you know, Manchester who uh, has now got probably a, a larger number of private equity funds and houses than I've ever known in the, in the North since working in corporate finance. Um, and the people who work in those private equity funds to a fair degree are, and I, I'm not, a number of them might be listening now, so oh, this is right, is a decent, fair people. So not, you know, not what SME owners might think that they are. They are, they are there to help and, and build businesses. So, but you're right, Richard, I think it's, it's probably not as understood as it should be. Um, and I think it, it provides an excellent option in the current climate because as Mark said, there's a lot of money around, a lot of it is debt, but there's a lot of private equity funds who haven't been able to invest where they would have liked in businesses just because of the situation we've been in. Thanks very much. Now, I'm going to ask all three of you to do your Mystic Meg job and cast your eyes into those crystal balls. And I wonder if you could, let's, let's, let's have a little stab, a little stab at where we're going next. So what types of business do we think are going to be changing hands? What types of finance are going to be backing them? What do you reckon, gents? What types of businesses are going to be changing hands? What types of finance are we going to be relying on? Ben? Um, I think an easy one and an, an, an obvious one is any form of SaaS business with, with strong recurring revenue. I, you just see it, it. It's constantly been a feature of last year. It will be this year even more so. Um, that's an easy one. Um, we, we have clients like that and um, it's, you know, it's, it's an obvious area of growth and, and, and you'll see a hell of a lot of it. Thanks a lot. Uh, Mark, what kinds of sectors do you expect the busyness to be in and what kind of funding balance do you expect them to be looking at? 
Um, I might swerve that one ever so slightly, and I, I don't think it's necessarily about sectors themselves. Um, I think it's the appetite of the business owner, and I think COVID has a massive impact on businesses and the ups and downs, and, and those that own have uh, sort of lifestyle businesses think, I've just had enough. Uh, I'm happy to sort of sell up now and, uh, and retire. So I think we've seen a few of those opportunities that are there. For, for businesses that want to acquire and those that want to sell. So I think it's about the appetite of the business owner. And uh, I think the, these various ways and means of funding these transactions, but I think as uh, private equity gets uh, a little bit more um, headlines, I think that will come into play that little bit more as well. Uh, given you. That there is Sorry. a lot of debt out there at the moment. Well, that was tremendous. You, you said you you said you swerved my question, which whichever question it was you were answering, it was brilliant because because that that was a really very very solid summary. Thank you very much. And Tim Mills, to you, um, what what kind of businesses? Where, when do you expect the activity to pick up? Uh, when do you expect things to go for it? And what is the next level activity? I mean, we've heard a, a suggestion that it might literally be distressed business owners have had enough. Yeah, I think there's a mix. I think activity has picked up. It started picking up kind of September onwards. So we saw that deal activity was really ramping up. I think that will continue. Um, I think there'll be a, a head of steam, as Mark said, his frustration of certain business owners thinking, you know, I've been through enough of this now. If there's a deal to be done, we want to want to get on with it. Um, I think Ben's right. I think software and health related businesses will, will do well, clearly, because <laughs> of where we are in the current uh, environment and the economic uh, situation we're in. However, I think down the line, and I'm not sure how far this will be, there must be a head of steam building up with regards to holidays, travel, recreational, and you know, going out again. Uh, and th those times will come. It might be two years, three. I have no idea. But at some point, there'll be a there'll be a big surge on those sort of areas. Our so, friends at Pacers think it, think it'll be a bit earlier than that. Could well be. Could well be. So I think it's one of those. If you're in those sectors and you can hold on and and keep you know keep your head above water, there's probably better times ahead. I would hope. And I've got a final question. This is coming from Azim Khan at Gemini Group, uh, who's obviously on the acquisition trail. So, gentlemen, I think you better log this name because you're going to have to go and find this guy as a client. Um, Azim wants to know, what's the best place for me to look for businesses for sale? I don't like the agency routes. Uh, Tim? Yep, yeah, I can understand that. Depending on the type of business and the size <laughs> of business. So, if agents agency route isn't the way to go forward, then probably maybe looking at speaking to someone like ourselves or if they've got advisors already to help doing that 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 target search because a lot of these businesses that will be potential targets won't be with agencies or even be thinking about selling they'll be waiting for someone to come knocking on the door you know it's finding those businesses earlier well i think uh, asim is interested in anything in the fm sector what, what about you, uh, you mark um where, where where should we send our friends looking for um opportunities yeah, I think it's, um, as Tim said, really, it's uh, speaking to your professional advisors, um, particularly the accountants and corporate finance uh, departments within them, because they will, uh, they're at the call face in terms of speaking to their clients. So that's probably the, the best route if you're not uh, um, keen on speaking to uh, vendor agents. Thank you. And final, final word to you, Ben. Um, it's the same question. Where, where, where do you advise clients when they're, they're I want to buy, I'm not quite sure to look, I think it's a this. What do you say to them, Ben? I think um, it, it very much depends on the sector. Um, but um, especially in the Northwest, Lancashire, you know, it, it is a very close business community. Um, people know each other um, and do business with each other regularly. Um, so if it's a sector, specific sector, often trade bodies, um, and, and specialists in those fields um, know, you know, who is looking to acquire and who isn't. So as, as Mark says, speaking to your advisors um, and, and the local community, you know, they're, they're, they're strong businesses out there. And, you know, we've had a couple on previously and, um, you know, people know them and, and know if they're acquiring or not. So um, speaking to your advisors definitely is, is sensible. Thanks ever so much, gents. It's, it's been a privilege to have this, this sort of level of con consultancy advice that you've been able to give to us. Um, thanks for joining us and thank you for supporting this event. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. That does conclude the formal element of our business today, but stay with us for some informal networking in a moment. Thank you for tuning in and thank you for your many and varied contributions today. Thank you for all the questions. Thanks to our speakers 
uh, our interviewees at the beginning. That was John Flood and Paul Fox. A uh, huge thanks to our panellists. Uh, I'm going to list them all in one go. Paul Harper, Janine Murray, Paul Ainsco, Matt Hurst, Mark Gibbons, Ben Dredge and Tim Mills. And thanks to Lancashire Business Views partners on this event. They were Access to Finance, Azets and CG Professional. If you are thinking of buying and selling a business, ladies and gentlemen, please think about using the, our friends that you've met today to at least offer you some of the, the first line advice and hopefully you'll be able to do some work with them in the future. Our final thanks are to our friends here at Big Tank Productions for their televisual expertise and steering the autocue and pointing cameras at me. And also thanks to, to Holly back at uh, Lancashire Business View HQ and all everybody else involved in our team on that. This event will be covered extensively in the March-April issue of Lancashire Business View magazine and online, reaching our 50,000 readers and viewers. We hope that today's conversations will be the start of many more. And if you've been inspired to do your deal, tell us, because this time next year, I'd like you on one of our panels. I've been Richard Slater. If you can buy it in Lancashire, buy it in Lancashire. But for now, thank you all. <laughs>